Let us rejoice in wonder, love, and praise, for we are standing on holy ground. The Spirit calls us to proclaim God's goodness, for the God of our forebears is with us today.
pray. Almighty God, we pray this morning that your spirit might enliven our worship and enlighten our souls during this hour of prayer. May we hear the divine voice as we loosen our tongues in your praise, and may our hearts be filled with the love of the one who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A reading of Psalm number 119, verses 89 through 96. The Lord exists forever. Your word is firmly fixed in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth, and it stands fast. By your appointment they stand today, for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my misery. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours, save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked lie and wait to destroy me, but I consider your decrees. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. Let us prayerfully remember the family of Penny Putnam, the family of Alan Dorn, the family of Sona Elizabeth Averill Wyman, Mia Falvey, Jack Wynne, Bill Young, Cody Pound, George Gray, Helen Loomis, Obie O'Brien, Heather Stevenson, Ed Stevenson, Perry Green, Finn Daly, Kayla Daly, Brooke Daly, Amara Lehman, the Lawton family, the people of Maui, the people of California, Daniela and Matteo Siriello, and their parents, and all medical staff devoting their lives to helping children, all service women and servicemen, all prisoners of war, all innocents caught up in violence, all God's creatures, both great and small. Pray we now in silence. God of our forebears, we come before you this day rejoicing that you continue to lead your people in paths of righteousness, seeking our good, blessing our best intentions, and loving us despite ourselves. We offer to you once again our hopes for tomorrow, our thoughts for today, and our thanks for your goodness to us in the past. May we always remember, Lord, that you are always close by, ready to answer our calls for help and to hear our praises and prayers of thanksgiving. In your name, O oh God, we seek to live our lives, modeling our actions on your Son, seeking to fulfill his wishes, attempting to discern your will and your plan for us so that we might live lives that are fully devoted to you and to Christ and his kingdom, which we seek to prepare here on earth. We are grateful, Heavenly Father, that you are mindful of our needs, supportive of our best efforts, and attentive to our most lofty longings. Remind us, O oh God, that we are to pray, not just for ourselves, but also for the peace of Jerusalem and for the welfare of the community in which we reside. Help to see, O Lord, that the benefits which you shower so plentifully on us are to be shared with all your creatures and that our skills and talents are meant 
not just to please or to enrich ourselves, but are given so that all might enjoy and benefit from them. This day, we pray especially for other communities of faith around the world, knowing that we are but a small part of a worldwide effort to bring peace and understanding to all of humanity. We pray not just for congregational churches, but for all houses of worship in which your name is raised and which seek to follow your word in how they live their lives for the greater good. Bless all efforts for the common good, all strivings after righteousness, all attempts to bring your kingdom upon this earth. O God of all, we are thankful that your Son has gone ahead to prepare a place for us in your eternal kingdom. May the lives which we live here and now reflect the glory that will be ours one day, as we gather at the feet of your Son, seated at your right hand, for it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. This morning's scripture lesson is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, beginning at verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril? or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Here end the morning scripture lessons.
A couple of years ago, Susan and I had to take a little trip at something like two o'clock in the morning to the veterinary hospital. Our dog, Winnie, had a close, but not a very loving encounter with a porcupine in our backyard. Winnie didn't appear to be in any pain. The quills were stuck in her tough, leathery nose, but there was no mistaking the dozens of quills sticking out of her. Never having dealt with such a situation before, we whisked Winnie off to Hartford, and as the saying goes, all's well that ends well. I don't know much about flora and fauna at all, and porcupines are not in my usual range of interests and curiosities. But it got me to thinking, how in the world do such animals get close enough to each other to have baby porcupines? The secret, as it turns out, is that when it comes time, usually in late autumn, porcupines can relax their quills sufficiently to allow nature to take its course, thus allowing for another generation of animals to be tormented by even more quills. And to this day, whenever we let Winnie out in our fenced-in backyard, we always admonish her to steer clear of suspicious-looking beasties. As we know all too well, there will always be porcupine people gracing our lives. And there are a few people out there who might think that we can get a bit prickly from time to time ourselves. Either way, we might be tempted to steer clear of porcupines for our own good. But God, strangely enough, has some other ideas. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about loving each other. And that means we should love even those who don't seem particularly well disposed toward us. For it's relatively easy to love those who already love us, but God is calling us to a higher standard. Put another way, birds of a feather flocking together is normal, but what catches God's eye is when we love in ways that go above and beyond business as usual. The call of the gospel is to relax our quills. For those of us who love God must love our brothers and sisters, as well as our neighbors, even the particularly prickly ones. Sometimes that might seem like a tall order. Not everyone has good neighbors. But God has a way of not just laying down the law and telling us what needs to be done, or else. God doesn't ask of us anything that God himself won't participate in. Sending his son to live among us, for us, and with us is proof enough of that. And God sent his son for all of us. What a daunting example to follow when you think of it. And then to top it all off, as if to underscore the high standard Jesus sets for us, Scripture makes it clear that God loves us no matter what. And thus, we are called to do the same. Yikes. I have on my shelf a booklet entitled Your God is Too Small by J.B. Phillips. You may recognize him as the translator of the New Testament into English, suitable for use in schools. Your God is Too Small is an easy read, running only about 125 pages, and I would encourage anyone to have a look at it if you can get your hands on it. And yes, it is still in print. The idea behind the book is that some of the ways we think about God can actually be harmful to our spiritual and mental health because, well, we can be very inaccurate about what God is actually like. For example, God is not a cosmic policeman lurking just out of sight in order to catch us engaging in even the pettiest infractions of divine commands. 
There's a reason that the hymn isn't called softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling gotcha. God doesn't operate that way. On the other hand, God is not an indulgent grandfatherly figure who we hope will let us get away with just about anything, no matter what the collateral damage to others or even ourselves. I won't go through all the false images of God that people have come up with through the centuries. For that, you can read what J.B. Phillips has to say easily enough. But while we say with John and Paul and all of the apostles that God is love, we have to make sure our God isn't too small. I'm not sure we fully know what God is love actually means and what the implications of that truth are for our lives. In just six words, it can be summarized this way. God loves us no matter what. Surely, if God loves porcupines, then apparently the rest of us get a passing grade as well. Put another way, loving us is what Jesus does for a living. No ifs, ands, or buts. And Jesus simply asks that we seriously emulate his example. Now that can be a tall order, quite scary if you think about it. And God realizes that too. As if in anticipation of our uneasiness at that, there is a short common phrase that appears repeatedly in scripture. And as Jesus says so often, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. We can sometimes fail to catch the significance of this short, common, oft-repeated phrase of six words because it is almost a bit too Pollyanna for some of us. And that command, yes, it is a command, is be not afraid. We hear those words at Christmas, since, as we all know, that is what the angel said to the shepherds. But these glad tidings also come to us in Isaiah, when we hear those words spoken by God through the prophet to give us assurance that the Almighty will uphold us. In fact, over 350 times those three words recur in Scripture. Obviously, they must be rather important. Or maybe it's just that a lot of people spend a good deal of their lives being fearful. Maybe a little of both. And that brings us to what the Apostle Paul wrote to us in Romans, words that we heard this morning. Have no fear, for nothing can separate us from the love of God. And then Paul gives us a list of things we might be fearful of, a list that goes way beyond porcupine quills. Things like hardship, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and the sword. This is not some arbitrary list that the apostle drew up to scare us all. These, in effect, are milestones in the apostle's own autobiography, enumerating what Paul himself had to endure for the sake of the gospel. Paul does not deny their dangers, but affirms that in the end, they have no power over him, for nothing can separate him and us from the love of God. Paul assures us that if things go wrong in our lives, it is not because God has given up on us or has rejected us. God's love for us is unconditional. It is not terminated by our failures, for we all fall short of the glory of God. But God chose us, and then, as if to top it all off, we hear the voice of the Savior say in John's Gospel, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. 
I give them eternal life and they will never perish for no one will snatch them out of my hand. Indeed, we have nothing to fear. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Amen. May the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with us and in our homes and with our loved ones now and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.